So good morning, welcome to numerical methods for mathematical finance. And we started a section on discretization, time discretization of stochastic processes. That is, we have a time continuous ETO stochastic process. And from it, we generate uh, approximations that are random variables at a given time discretization. So our section is time discretization of stochastic process. And I already had um, a little tour where I specified or where I just uh, defined uh, some numerical schemes and maybe the most prominent example and also a, a very you know, useful scheme is the Euler scheme. Also, it is maybe yeah, often enough to do the Euler scheme because we have in the background this technique of transforming our state variable X, so here X, to a different state variable Y via Ito's lemma, and then perform the discretization on that variable and transform back. But this technique is really very powerful yeah, and uh, can often reduce uh, the discretization error a lot. So we should maybe study the Euler scheme um, a little bit more. And today I would like to discuss the convergence rate of the Euler scheme. So we have these time discrete approximation, the family of time discrete random variables, and that should somehow approximate the true solution of the original SDE. So before I uh, state uh, the convergence, actually we have to discuss a little bit here in which sense do we understand this convergence? And by in which sense, I do not mean strong or weak convergence. Yeah? So you know, know there are different norms or whatever. What I mean is what are the objects yeah, that go to zero or go to infinity. So we have to discuss this a little bit. So the first step is maybe clear. We consider a sequence of time discretizations. So this is ti, i from zero to n. So these are n time steps that discretize a given interval, say from zero, yeah, just by convention to capital T. So I have here the time discretization. It could be, for example, just an equipartitioning of this interval from zero to capital T yeah, into then n intervals. And now I consider a sequence of that. Okay, so there's here this superscript n. Yeah, so I have many such time discretization. And they should become finer and finer, where finer is now defined in the sense that the largest interval, so the maximum interval size, or if it is an equipartitioning, then the interval size uh, goes to zero. Okay, so I'm considering now convergence in the sense that my Hn h, the size of the largest discretization interval, goes to zero as n goes to infinity. So that's the first step. Then I consider on this sequence of time discretization. Now a sequence of Euler schemes. So you see that now for every time discretization here, denoted with this superscript N, I also have a time discrete stochastic process, X tilde superscript N. They all share the same initial value. And then we have the Euler scheme that the value at the next time discretization point, so that guy is the value of the previous time discretization point plus the coefficient evaluated at the previous time discretization point, so mu times the time step size plus the coefficient sigma evaluated at the previous time discretization point times the Brownian increment 
delta w. So this time discrete stochastic process should now, yeah, in some sense, converge to the solution of the two SDE. So dx is mu dt plus sigma dw. Of course, they also have here the same um, initial value. So next step is, yeah, in which sense does a time discrete stochastic process converge to a time continuous stochastic process? So what you have on the top is just a sequence of such uh, realizations, yeah? Okay, but uh, your true stochastic process is uh, something continuous. Okay, so in which sense do the dots converge? So we have to specify this. So you could think that you just now connect the Euler scheme approximations by some interpolation. Yeah? So for example, you could do a piecewise constant stochastic process, which would look like that, okay? Or you could say that it is piecewise linear, maybe that's a bit nicer. So my time discrete stochastic process, my Euler scheme approximations become a time continuous stochastic process. And then I can consider, okay, what is now the relation of these two stochastic process? And actually this may be a trivial detail, but it's already good to understand this. This is not what we are doing. So we now define the time continuous stochastic process that constitutes the Euler scheme. And this is actually this guy. So the above scheme only defines here the X till the superscript N at discrete time points. And now we have to also define it on the times in between the time discretization points. And what we do looks like um, a linear interpolation. So we do a linear interpolation of the drift part. But look what happens here to the Brownian motion. We just take the Brownian motion that connects the starting and the end value with a constant coefficient. So you could say what we're actually doing is so-called Brownian bridge. Yeah, we are bridging between the two random variables with a Brownian motion. So the picture the previous picture looks like that. And yeah, maybe to, to illustrate this, if for example, this coefficient here has a dependency on the X, for example, that the Sigma is large for X large and small for X small, like in a log normal model, then this would mean that if you go here from a low point to a high point, the volatility is maybe small, but if you go from a higher point to a lower point, okay, I always take the starting value, then the volatility is maybe larger. Okay, so something like that. So to summarize as a remark, yeah, so note that the definition we had on the previous slide. So now my time continuous completion of the Euler scheme approximation has the properties that at little t equals ti, it agrees with the 
Euler scheme approximations. So you see that here, if you just plug in T equals T I plus one, then this comes to T I plus one. So this here is just the Delta T I, the time step size. And this here comes to the T I plus one. So this here is just the Delta W, the Brownian increment. So it agrees with that, but it is different from the naive piecewise linear interpolation or piecewise constant interpolations of just the random variables. So maybe just to add the pictures here, this guy would be the piecewise constant approximations of the random variables and the guy below is the piecewise linear approximations. And this is not what we are doing. So the process X tilde superscript N on the time discretization T superscript N uh, on the nth refinement or nth time discretization is an eto stochastic process actually with piecewise constant coefficients. And the nice thing is that we can also write down the classical eto differential notation. So if you go back here and you apply the differential, okay, differentiating this, this is dx tilde. So that's a constant, that's a constant coefficient. This guy is just the dt. No? And this guy is just the dw. So I have that dx tilde is mu, that mu dt plus that sigma dw. And it's defined on these partial intervals with piecewise constant coefficients. So the definition of my stochastic process that constitutes the Euler scheme, you, know, you could say interpolates the Euler scheme, is this guy here, dx tilde is mu of t and x tilde dt plus sigma of t and x tilde dw. Um, maybe it's also nice to illustrate this a little bit. So I created a small uh, numerical experiment uh, because uh, sometimes it's nice to just visualize these things again. Yeah? I already uh, have drawn the pictures. Yeah, And uh, what's also nice, the stuff which I use here in this small computer program is just the stuff we develop during this lecture. And maybe this is also nice uh, from numerical methods. Uh, you can create illustrations of some theoretical aspects like how this process is defined, which maybe improve a little bit your um, intuition. I do not want to go to the code uh, because the code is not so uh, interesting, yeah? but um, later when we have continued in the lecture, you maybe see that all I use here is just the stuff, yeah, the tools that we create uh, for us. Yeah? So I have a small code here. Um, so the idea is the following. Uh, I cannot plot the true stochastic process and the Euler scheme because in the computer I have to discretize anyway. So I have to create some thing that constitutes my true stochastic process. And the idea is that I will use for the true stochastic process actually an Euler scheme with very fine time steps, say 1,600 time steps. So very fine thing. And then I view this guy as my X and I try to approximate it with a very coarse Euler scheme. Yeah? So I will now do um, say an Euler scheme and approximate it with say just eight time steps or 16 time steps. So there are 100 little or 200 little time steps in between. And then I can maybe compare the piecewise constant interpolation, the linear interpolation and the Euler scheme process when um, approximating this guy. So this is a little bit my code. So I have here these 1,600 time steps. I use 100 Monte Carlo simulation paths. I create a Brownian motion. 
yeah, I have a certain initial value, uh, a certain drift and a certain volatility. And actually I'm doing a Black-Scholes model. So this is a log normal process. So the coefficients, they truly change. Yeah? I do a normal Euler scheme on a log normal process. So the coefficients change if the stochastic process changes. Okay, and then I do a little bit stuff here with different refinements of the intervals in between. Yeah, and you see the code is not so long actually. There's a little bit hidden here where I define the process, the coefficients, yeah, the piecewise constant coefficient or whatever. Um, and then I do three plots. So this here is the true Euler scheme. Oops. Uh, so this here is the uh, Euler scheme approximation. This here is the piecewise linear approximation. And this here is the piecewise constant approximation. Yeah, so you see, it's just a function t that maps to the value of the stochastic process as at the index that comes before t at a time discretization that is the coarse, coarse uh, time discretization. Okay, just a little numerical experiment and maybe we can uh, have a look at this just for illustration. So this guy is now my true fine stochastic process, the one which I would like to approximate with my Euler scheme. And if yeah, the Euler scheme and my linear interpolation uh, would use the same number of time steps, of course, there's no difference. Yeah? The approximation is um, exactly the same. So there's nothing, nothing to see here. But now if you use just fewer time steps, so you see that you clearly see here the piecewise constantness of this stochastic process. So I'm just connecting the random variables. Yeah? So the different colors are different omegas, different Monte Carlo passes. I'm just connecting the random variables with horizontal lines, or here I'm connecting the guys with um, uh, yeah, linear function. Yeah, or here it is actually an extrapolation that jumps down to the next value. Um, if we use the stochastic process that we just defined, yeah? So the Eto process with constant coefficients, then actually this looks like that, yeah? On 160 time steps. And you see yeah, that it really looks still very similar, yeah? You, you find some differences if you look very closely, okay? So for example, here, sometimes the size of this peak here, this peak here goes up to one, 1,200, but here it doesn't reach this. And we have to understand this a little bit, but the shape is still the same. And the shape is the same because we use the same random numbers in between, right? Okay, this is an important thing here. Yeah. So we use the same random numbers in between, but maybe the coefficient that is in front of the random numbers is different. And the random numbers decide whether we go up or down. So the random numbers decide, yeah, in, in you, you draw a uniform random number. So now you have all this numerical method and you have maybe a better intuition what's going on. You draw a uni uniform random number between zero and one. And if it's below one half, the inversion of the distribution function will generate a negative normal distribution uh, value. And if it's above one half, it will generate a positive. Yeah. So it decides whether it goes up and down. So the shape is very, very similar. So maybe you can go even a bit coarser. So let's delete these three guys here. And now only look at 16 time steps. Or maybe for illustration, what did I use here? Uh, eight. Or maybe for illustration also, let's skip that and go to the, go to the case where I have here eight. Eight time step, yeah, because this is very nice. Uh, the case with eight time steps is the one that where you have actually a constant here between just these dividers. I have a constant coefficient. Yeah? So really the piecewise constant and the piecewise linear, they look ugly. You also see that my random variables already generate negative values in the discretization. But if you compare here the 
true solution. And my Euler scheme process, you still they see that they look very similar. But for example, here, the levels are different. So the levels are different because if you take a look here at this time discretization, yeah, so we have that the coefficient is constant on this interval. That means he is taking the volatility he is seeing here at the starting value. And then the random numbers tell him that he should move up. Okay, so he will use for this interval here, he will use a very small coefficient. Yeah, my, my model is a Black Schultz model, it's a sigma constant times x. Yeah? So he will use a very small volatility coefficient. While on the true solution, as he's moving up, the coefficient is increasing. So it means if he has reached here this level, he will have a very high volatility, much higher volatility. So you see the shape is still the same, but the volatility coefficient used here at that time is much higher compared to the volatility used here, okay? Okay, so maybe that's a nice little exercise that gives you now an intuition of the object I have defined. So the object that we define is the E2 process with piecewise constant coefficients, where the coefficients are frozen at the previous time discretization points. So now we have two time continuous stochastic processes. We have the stochastic process of the Euler scheme, and I have the true solution of the original STE. And now I have to define in which sense does one stochastic process, so one is a sequence of stochastic processes, converge to uh, another stochastic process. So we will discuss two different versions of convergence here. So we will discuss strong and weak convergence. And Actually, weak convergence sounds like, okay, it's maybe a second class convergent, but it's the convergence that is more relevant to us. So first, strong convergence of E2 stochastic processes. We say that a stochastic process or a sequence of stochastic processes X tilde superscript N converges strongly to X if so first for a given time, we look at the difference of the two random variables, the true solution X and the approximation X till the superscript N at that time. So we look at the absolute value of X minus X till the superscript N at time little t. And then we take the supremum over all these errors. Okay, this is the random variable of the error. It's still a random variable. And from that, we take the expectation. Okay, and if this quantity goes to zero as n goes to infinity, we say that we have a strong convergence. Then we can also define the convergence order. The convergence order is that we just look how fast does this error go to zero. So we say that the sequence X to the superscript N converges to X with strong order gamma. If we can bound the error, so expectation of the supremum of the difference, absolute value of the difference of the two random variables at uh, the time little t is smaller than c times h n. So our parameter describing the fineness of our time discretization to the power of gamma. So if there exists a constant c larger than zero, that this error is less or equal c times 
Hn to the power of gamma. So that's strong convergence. So we really look at, yeah, so we have these sample passes. We really look at the difference, the maximum difference on each of these uh, sample passes, yeah, and along the time. Um, and maybe the previous exercise was not so su such a bad idea because you already saw here that there are maybe different errors, yeah? So there is in each interval, the error that you have, that you have a different coefficient. So the thing that we looked at here, we have a different coefficient and the two things yeah, go wide in a different way that will contribute to the error. But there's also an accumulation because due to this effect, the two things could start at different levels. Yeah, They could start at different levels because we somehow accumulate the error. So in addition to strong convergence, we have the weak convergence. And for the weak convergence, we just look at the error for a fixed time and then apply also um, a test function, F. So we say that X tilde superscript N converges weakly to X if for any fixed little t, and any Lipschitz continuous function f, we have conversions for the expression expectation f of x of t. Yeah. So I'm looking at the true solution, expectation f of x of little t, and I'm looking at the approximate solution, expectation of f of x tilde superscript n of little t. So I just take a slice yeah, of time little t. I have my random variable x tilde approximating the random variable x. And then I look at the quantity. Yeah, so this is my test quantity, expectation of a test function f on this. This is of course for any test function, so you can check the expectation yeah, by just f being the int uh, by uh, identity. You can check if the variance agrees. You can check also if quantiles agree. Yeah, So you can check all these uh, properties, but I do not check well if, if values agree. So if this difference, so I look at this difference for a fixed n, if this difference now converges to zero as n goes to infinity, then I say that we have weak convergence. And likewise, we can define the convergence order. So x tilde superscript n converges to x with weak order gamma, if I can just bound this difference for a fixed n with a constant c times hn to the power of gamma. I already mentioned that weak convergence is a, a little bit more relevant to us. And by that, I meant, for example, for the application of devaluation of financial derivatives. Also for many other applications, weak convergence is maybe the more relevant concept. Because the X is maybe the model for the underlying. The F is then the payoff function or the value function of a financial derivative depending on the underlying. And expectation of f of x is from our universal valuation theorem, the value which we would like to calculate. So actually we are exactly in this situation. We like to approximate our model which is given as a time continuous ETO process with an Euler scheme. And 
then we like to calculate the expectation f of that approximation. And I would like to have a small error. And then of course comes the next step. The next step is that we approximate this expectation here by the Monte Carlo method, for example. So it's the next step in then the approximation of the valuation. I would like to make a little bit uh, simplification um, in the notation. So in the following, I will prove that the Euler scheme converges strongly and weakly, but we will immediately prove the convergence order. Because if you go back here to the definition, if you have proven that you have a certain convergence order, yeah, then of course you also have this result. Yeah? So one follows from two in both definitions, of course. So it's enough to prove the convergence order. But if I would like to prove the convergence order, I can just say, given a time discretization with a certain age, yeah, with a certain maximum time step size age given, I prove this estimate. So actually, I do not need a sequence of such time discretization. I just need to prove the estimate for a given time discretization. And then you can plug in finer and finer time discretization into this estimate. So I can actually get rid in this proof yeah, in the notation from this superscript n here. So I just consider now x tilde being the Euler scheme approximation with a given time discretization ti approximating x. So this makes the notation a little bit nicer. So to ease notation, we consider now a fixed n yeah, because we will just prove that our guy has a certain strong order. Yeah, strong order is one half and weak order, which is one convergence. So I can use here x tilde instead of x tilde superscript n. And I will just use h for the hn. And I will just use ti for the ti superscript n. So what I do is I consider the stochastic process x tilde of t, which is defined as x tilde of ti plus freezing the coefficient at the starting value of the approximation, mu of ti, x tilde of ti, times the time step, yeah, the fractional time step now from ti to little t, plus sigma of ti, x tilde of ti, times the Brownian increment from ti to t. So that is my e to process with piecewise constant coefficients. So this all holds here. So this definition holds on the interval where little t is between ti and ti plus one. And when I move to the next interval, the definition changes by using different coefficients. So I can also maybe ease a little bit the notation if I just define, well, here, the stochastic process of the coefficients. So this is now um, a piecewise constant stochastic process, the coefficient process. So I can write this stochastic process as dx tilde is mu tilde dt plus sigma tilde dw, where mu tilde and sigma tilde are now the processes that just have the value, the random variable mu at the starting point of the uh, uh, time discretization interval evaluated at the starting point of the time discretization interval with, of course, here my previous um, approximation. But this is also a bit nicer yeah, because then later in the derivation, when I write it down, yeah, I just use mu or mu tilde and you immediately know 
uh, what I'm doing. Yeah? It's either the piecewise constant coefficient using the previous Euler step approximation or the mu, it's the true uh, coefficient. It eases a little bit the notation and makes the proof a little bit shorter. Then to prove the strong convergence, we need some estimates for stochastic processes that I will just state. So actually I need four little things. Yeah, The proof of these four little things yeah, is often not so lengthy, yeah, it's easy. Uh, and I'm sure, yeah, maybe you have already had a lecture where these things were presented. Um, and I just state this here as an ingredient, yeah, which I will use in the proof, but I will not prove these uh, little helpers. So the first thing is that I have existence of the moments of the ETO process and of the Euler scheme. If the coefficients are nice, yeah, in the sense that mu and sigma have at most linear growth. So that means they exist the C zero such that mu of t and x yeah, viewed now as a function here on say the time axis. So that is here zero and t times my state space. Okay, that's maybe here some rd. Then I can bound mu by c times one plus x, so at most linear course in x, and also sigma, sigma I can bound it, yeah, absolute value of sigma, I can bound it by c times one plus absolute value of x. Uh, so of course it can happen that in between your coefficient has a larger growth, yeah, so for lo locally, yeah, so this is just the other as I'm plotting, because you still have here the, you can still bound it here by the constant. Uh, so it means in the asymptotic, uh, when X becomes very large, uh, you can bound it with a linear cost. So for example, um, this would be the case here for my log normal process, uh, for my log normal process, Black-Schultz model, there the sigma um, is just, the sigma of X is just, constant sigma star times x. Yeah? Okay, there, um, of course, this, this holds. If you have this co uh, condition of the um, coefficients, then you have that the moments, so there is um, some p here yeah? of the stochastic process and also of the Euler scheme approximation, yeah, which is just the guy with the frozen coefficients, they um, exist. So uh, if I look at absolute value of X to the power of P, uh, and then I take the supremum over here, my time interval from zero to T, then this is bounded by some constant n, k, yeah? So by some constant n. So there is a k that um, actually the expectation of the supremum of absolute value of x to the power of p is less than equal k. Yeah, maybe to provide you a little bit intuition uh, of what's going on here, I would like to have this, of course, here for a fixed time horizon, but for any time horizon. Yeah. So I would like to do my Euler scheme for a while, yeah, and maybe I would like to do it for 10 years, or 20 years or whatever. And if you would like to do it for say more or less arbitrary time horizon, the constant of course depends maybe on the time horizon, then this um, assumption here is not so, so hard yeah, because if you just look at ordinary differential equations, so if you look at an ODE, then you already know that linear growth gives you a solution, yeah, or there can be a solution. But if you have, for example, quadratic throws, yeah, there is uh, an explosion. Yeah? And just to recall this, yeah, and this gives you maybe 
a bit of intuition what's going on here. Uh, just look here at dx is rx dt. Okay, so you all know the solution is the exponential function. If you differentiate exponential rt, so I have here exponential rt. If I differentiate that, this, this is r times exponential rt. So it's r times x. Yeah? So I have dx by d t is r times x. And then I just have to fulfill the initial condition. So if I plug in t equals zero, it should be, should be the initial condition x of zero. Okay, so this guy here is linear growth. Yeah? So this here would be my mu of x and my mu of x has linear growth in the x component. If you look at dx is rx squared dt. You know, then here I would have super linear growth in the coefficient. So this guy here would be my mu you know, and it would not fulfill this assumption. Well, do you know a solution of this guy? Uh, okay, I can tell you a solution of this guy is one divided by one divided by x zero minus rt. Okay, if you differentiate one divided by something, this is one divided by something squared times minus one. So I get um, a minus x squared if I differentiate this. Okay, if I differentiate this, I get a minus x squared. But then if I have the inner derivative, the inner derivative is minus r. So I have a plus r, yeah x squared. Yeah? So you see, if you differentiate this here, you get actually r times x squared. Okay, check this is the solution and then just fulfill the uh, initial value. So if you plug in t equals zero, you have one divided by one divided by, so you just have the x of zero. Okay, so this is a solution. And you see that this guy explodes This guy explodes in finite time. Yeah? So if r times t yeah, is equal to one divided by the initial value, yeah, then this guy explodes. Yeah? r is positive if you make t large enough. Yeah? So it will explode at t equal one divided by r times x zero. Okay, so that seems here a reasonable assumption. And if we have this assumption fulfilled, we have that the moments, yeah, so the, these integrals um, exist. I need existence of these guys. Uh, the second ingredients that I need is that my stochastic process is continuous and it is Lipschitz continuous. Yeah, if my coefficients fulfill a global Lipschitz condition. So assume that mu and sigma satisfy a global Lipschitz condition. So that means I have a constant C such that if I now look at mu at T and X, so, the, so at given time and a given state value minus mu of S and Y. So a different time and a different state value. Then I can bound this by the constant C times the difference in time plus the difference in state value in, in X minus Y. Yeah, or you could say I, you can bound it by C times T minus S plus, and maybe another C yeah, doesn't care, X minus Y. So that's my global uh, Lipschitz conditions. Huh? I have Lipschitz con continuity in the uh, tuple of my uh, coefficients uh, of, my, of my arguments. And of course, the same holds here for uh, the sigma. So if you have this for all your times and all states, then there exists a constant k, such that if you now look at the difference of the two random variables, x at t and x at s, absolute value squared, then this is bounded by a constant times the difference in time. So I have a Lipschitz condition of 
the ETO process. So expectation of absolute value X of T minus X of S is less or equal K times, okay, that somehow also depends on the initial value. That's not so important for us. So K times one plus expectation of the initial value squared times T minus S. So if you make the time step smaller, so the difference in the stochastic process values yeah, uh, is also getting smaller. The next thing we need is the dupe martingale inequality. So let X denote a martingale eto process. So actually that's just that I do not have a DT part. Yeah? So that means DX is some sigma of T, X of T, DW. Then for P larger than one, I have that I can bound the maximum of absolute value of X of little t to the power of P. So somehow like the peace moment, but actually the maximum of all those guys, yeah, expectation of this, I can bound it by the corresponding expression at the final time. So I can bound expectation maximum X to the power of P by a constant times expectation of X of capital T to the power of P. So if you think that you have some, some stochastic process that looks a little bit like a Brownian motion, yeah? So a scale Brownian motion. So you have far paths that looks like that. Okay, that sounds to some extent reasonable yeah, because what you do here on the left side is you walk along the path and you always take um, the maximum value. So, and this then looks a little bit like taking, well, the path and then if the path has reached the maximum value and it goes down, okay, so you, you, you just cap it there yeah, and you take then actually that value. So you are becoming wider here, okay? But then you can bound this by say just the moment on the random variable that you observed at the final, final value. Okay, so we can bound, uh, the moments that we observe the maximum of these guys in between by the corresponding value at the final time. And the last thing I need, yeah, okay, so also very elementary, maybe already known to you is the I2 isometry, because when we now prove the conversions of the Euler scheme, we will do estimates to integrals and we do some estimates for the dt part yeah so we need to estimate mu and minus mu tilde the, diff, the true coefficient and the approximated coefficient yeah? integrated from zero to t dt so we have to approximate this error. And we, when we are done with approximating actually this integral, the mu, yeah, the error on this, we have to repeat the same step on the sigma dw integral. But actually here, the I2 isometry gives us a nice relation you know, that maybe we can just reuse all the estimates that we have done for a dt part uh, for the dw part. So let phi denote an adapted stochastic process. Then you have that integral from S to capital T phi dw. So actually if 
if I define x as phi dw, then what I have here is just x of capital T minus x of S, okay? Then if I look here, then I see this is the second moment, yeah? Okay, so if this is a martingale, this is a martingale, then this is just the variance, yeah? So what you have here is just the variance that we have accumulated So this is just the variance of x of t minus x of s. Then the I2 summary tells me, okay, the variance that we are accumulating or the variance that we have at the end you know, for this increment is the accumulated instantaneous variance. Because this guy is just the So this guy is just the instantaneous variance for an infinitesimal time step dt. So this is say the, the sigma squared, yeah? So you have sigma dw, it's the sigma squared. And this whole part is then the accumulated accumulated variance. Okay, so I assume you know the E2 isometry and we maybe have also um, a nice uh, intuition for this. So now we have some tools you know, that we can use and I can start proving the strong convergence of the Euler scheme. So endowed with these four guys, yeah, lemma 64, existence of moment, 66, Lipschitz continuity, 67, loop martingale inequality, and 68, I2, I2 asymmetry, we may now prove the convergence of the Euler scheme. So assume that we have some assumptions fulfilled. For example, we need our global Lipschitz condition so mu and sigma can be bounded by C times, or the difference yeah, of mu at T and X and mu at S and Y, uh, and also the difference of sigma at T and X and S and Y can be bounded by a constant times the time step and the state space difference. So this also implies that the assumption of lemma 64 is satisfies. Then X tilde superscript N converges to X with strong order one half. So this means from the definition, expectation of the random variable supremum over all times little t from zero to capital T, X of little t minus X tilde of little t is less or equal, a constant that may depend on the time horizon times h to the power of one half. So I use my simplified notation and the first thing uh, I note is that instead of here looking at absolute value of the error, you know, so like L1, I can look at absolute value squared of the error and prove that this guy then can be bounded by a constant C times H. Yeah? So I have a squared here and I have a squared compared to that here. The reason I uh, would prefer to working with the squared on the left-hand side, yeah, instead of just the absolute value, because then I can use some of the guys, yeah, which we have seen uh, on the previous slides. Yeah, so my little uh, tools, especially for example, I can use the I2 isometry to move from the DW yeah, to the DT. 
So how does this uh, follow? Yeah, you just apply the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality. Okay, what was that? So either written with integrals or here written with expectations. Expectations, expectation f times g can be bounded by expectation f squared square root times expectation g squared square root. Yeah, So square root of the expectation f squared times square root of expectation g squared. So that's the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality. And now I use this with f is equal to one. Then on the left-hand side, you just have expectation of g. So then I use my g as our error term, the supremum of absolute value x minus x tilde. So actually that's exactly this guy here. Okay. Then on the left-hand side here of the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality, I have the expression here on the left-hand side of my convergence order estimate. Okay, and on the right-hand side, I now have, okay, I have used F equals one. So this is just expectation of one. This is just a one. So on the right-hand side, I now have the square root of the expectation of G squared. So I should have exactly on the right-hand side, this guy here with squared, yeah, so my G squared. And um, I have a square root on the outside, yeah? So a square root at one half here and a one half here. Then I just square on both sides, yeah? And I get this estimate. Okay, so if I have this guy, yeah? Then I can also bound this guy here with the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality, which is then this error term. So from that one follows my claim. So let me give you a short uh, sketch of the proof so that we already had the main, have the main idea uh, in the background. Um, first, we are looking here at the difference of X and X tilde at a given time little t. X and X tilde are stochastic processes. So I can express a difference of these two stochastic processes by the difference in the initial value. So x of zero minus x tilde of zero, but by assumption, the initial value is the same. So actually this difference here is already gone. Plus the integral from zero to s mu minus mu tilde d tau, plus the integral from zero to s sigma minus sigma tilde dw. Huh? So because you know, x of s is x zero plus integral mu dt plus integral sigma dw. And also x tilde is x tilde of zero plus integral mu tilde dt plus integral sigma tilde dw. So just plugging in that we know that these two guys are stochastic processes. So then the next step is that we look here at the absolute value of these guys. So you can just place here absolute value on the right-hand side. Of course, you can just move the absolute value to each integral, uh, triangle inequality. And you can also move the absolute value to the inside. Yeah, that only makes all the stuff larger. Okay, so I have here the absolute value on the inside. Then you see that inside here. So if you look, say, for example, okay, maybe we just try that. Uh, we do an absolute value here and we do an less or equal here. So I do an absolute value to the inside. That now I can estimate my coefficients. And here we have some nice assumption, yeah? Lipschitz condition, yeah? Lipschitz um, continuity. So, um, and Actually, these two guys here, they do not differ too much. So this thing, this thing is the mu tau x of tau 
minus the mu. And now I plug in the definition. This is at the previous time step and the x tilde at the previous time step, ti. Okay, so maybe I can now estimate this. I have the Lipschitz condition. So with a constant, and then we have the difference of the time step. But this guy is already an age. Okay, plus the difference of the axis. So I have x at t minus x tilde of ti. Okay, but now here, these, this part, you can again also estimate it by say another constant. So, okay, so we have an x of t and now we plug in a minus x of ti plus x of ti. So we go to the other time on the same stochastic process. And then we have the same time on the different stochastic process. Okay, and maybe this here also looks a little bit like a Lipschitz condition yeah, because we just have the different times. Maybe I like to write this a little bit nicer. Uh, let me move this a bit here. I'm sorry, but maybe it's nice to understand the, the idea nicely. Okay, that part here also looks a little bit like an H. So, but now we discover that we have here again, the same expression that we have on the left-hand side. Yeah? The difference of X and X tilde at some, some time. Okay, but there is, still the integral over this stuff. So you see that what we actually get is that we have that X minus X tilde is less or equal some constant times H plus an integral over X minus X tilde. So this looks very much like Cronwall's inequality. So this is a situation where one may consider that we work towards Cronwall's inequality, where my u is now actually the whole expression, expectation of maximum of x minus x tilde. So this is here my left-hand side. Yeah? And this guy will also appear on the right-hand side, but under the integral. So for Cronwall inequality, it is u is less or equal a plus b times integral over u. So if you have that, then Cronwall's inequality tells you that you can estimate the u by a times exponential bt. Yeah? So if you would differentiate here this guy, yeah, it would be du by dt is b times u, yeah? so this looks like uh, u is exponential bt with an initial condition yeah, given here by the a. Okay, so, so you have maybe a nice intuition also for the Cronwall uh, inequality. Yeah, and then we are actually done yeah? because um, this a here is all the stuff that we have estimated here in front. So this A here corresponds to an H. And I don't care 
about this guy here. I just plug in capital T and it will form a constant. Probably you got now the intuition that when we now do the estimates, it is good to get an H out, a plus H. Now, this is good. This is fine. But it is not a problem if we still have a term that has integral of the stuff that we have on the left-hand side underneath. So that's not, a, not, not an issue. So that's uh, the idea in the direction in which I would like to work. Yeah, and now it's maybe quickly to, or maybe, maybe we can quickly finish the, the proof. So I start on the left-hand side. The expression I would like to look at is here my expectation. Take the maximum of x of s minus x tilde of s squared, yeah, because we moved with the Cauchy-Schwarz already to the squared. And I plug in the definition of the stochastic processes like we did before. before. Okay, so that we get, it is the expectation of the maximum over all S, the difference of the initial value, plus the integral over the difference of the drift, plus the integral over the difference of the diffusion squared. And now I'm using A plus B plus C squared can be estimated by three times A squared plus B squared plus C squared. So I can move here these squared to the inside. Yeah? So I, knew, I now, have to work all the stuff slowly to the inside. Actually, I also like to work it under the integral. Yeah? So, and all, all the stuff, yeah, I would like to work the maximum under the integral, the squared under the integral, and such that it looks like Cornwall's inequality. It is the stuff on the left hand side under the integral on the right hand side, yeah? plus something that is smaller than h, or s can be estimated by a constant times h. So I, I have these uh, three terms and we can estimate these three terms uh, separately. So this guy here is already okay. This is equal to zero by um, assumption. So I need to estimate the drift part and the diffusion part uh, separately. So let's do this next. So three times expectation of the maximum integral over the drift part. I like to work the square from the outside of the integral to the inside of the integral. Yeah? So that's again, Cauchy-Schwarz. Yeah? So I can estimate now integral g of tau d tau squared so first, I make the integral larger if I always integrate the absolute value. So we do the absolute value to the g. And then I can use the same trick again. Yeah? Uh, in the inside, I have now 1 times g. And that can be estimated as, so integral over f times g can be estimated by integral over f squared square root of that multiplied with integral over g squared, square root of that. And I use it with f equals one and here the g equals g. So <clears throat> I have that here is the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality again. And last step, this guy integral from zero to s one dt is just an, an s. Yeah, sometimes we have parts where we have integral from zero to s yeah, uh, over something, uh, but we do not have to be afraid of these guys because we look at a finite time horizon. So the s here can be just replaced by the capital T. It's no issue because we have a finite time horizon. So integrating something small over the whole time is still something small. Yeah? So because we have 
um, um, this fixed time horizon and to something small is what we make smaller is the time discretization. So the time horizon stays fixed. So uh, using that, I can work actually the square here from the outside to the inside of the integral, just getting this additional constant T. Yeah, and I can also get rid of the maximum because, well, these guys here are all positive, yeah? So the maximum of the integral is attained at the final time. So I can actually replace here the maximum over all S by the capital T because we have here the absolute value, yeah? Or absolute value squared yeah, in, inside. So I have expectation from zero to capital T mu of the true SDE tau X of T minus mu tilde yeah, of the Euler scheme approximation. Now I can do my Lipschitz condition and estimate this difference here of the mu. So with the Lipschitz condition, I can estimate this a constant times the time difference a constant times the x difference, yeah, x minus x tilde. So I do the trick as before. So I have x at time tau minus x at time ti plus x at time ti minus x tilde of time ti. So now this guy here is the difference of the true solution and the Euler scheme only looked at the time discretization steps, but I can make this guy larger by just looking at the maximum of X of S minus X tilde of S. Okay, maybe you would have thought that this is a far too brutal step, yeah? But remember from now our sketch, we will later use Cornwall's inequality and it is perfectly okay if the left-hand side, yeah, so actually expectation of that guy here appears under the integral. For that, I still have to exchange expectation and integral, but this is just Fubini. Yeah? So it's already, it looks already nice. Yeah? So, and we have here an H and I have here actually something that is by the continuity of the stochastic process similar also to, to an H. So from that, yeah, I have expectation integral zero to T mu minus mu tilde squared D tau can now be estimated by three times K H squared. Here, I have to be a little bit careful. Okay, this stuff here holds for tau in the interval from Ti to Ti plus one. So I have to, if I now consider here the integral from zero to T, I have to look at the partial integrals yeah, from Ti to Ti plus one. So I write this part here as, a sum over all i from ti to ti plus one. And this blue part here will then give me expectation integral maximum x of s minus x tilde of x squared d tau. So this part here is already nice. It's the same stuff as on the left-hand side. Yeah? We need to use Fubini to swap the expectation and the integral. So we now get exactly that. Yeah? So including the expectation. So this guy is already nice. This is also already nice because I have an H squared. I would like to have an H yeah, for the conversions. So it's still this guy that has to be estimated. And now I can use here my lemma 66, the Lipschitz continuity of the process to estimate here 
this difference. And for that, I get actually, I also swap expectation and the integral. So I move the expectation inside the integral. I get that it is smaller k times h. On the outside, you still have the integrals, but then you just integrate over all times, yeah, uh, which will just add you another t, yeah, another t. So actually, there will be a c times t if you if you plug this um, estimate in. Yeah, so the integral over all the tau is just estimated with um, a capital T. So that does, doesn't matter. So I have together now with the 18, yeah, the starting point yeah, where we started moving the square inside the integral. I have the whole estimate that I can estimate this part, the drift part, expectation maximum integral mu minus mu tilde by exactly a constant times h plus the same stuff that is on the left-hand side, but now under an integral. So the left-hand side of the, the whole uh, um, expression. So now I need to repeat this for the stochastic part. So I need to repeat this for the dw part, the stochastic integral term. So that's now the guy sigma dw. Okay, but I can use the dupe martingale inequality and the i to asymmetry to just estimate this with sigma minus sigma tilde squared. So the coefficient squared uh, d tau. Okay, so I don't repeat all the step, steps for that. Uh, yeah, now we are done. Yeah, we have an estimate that u is less or equal c times h plus an integral u of s ds, where my u is my strong convergence error term. So I get from Cronwall's inequality that I can estimate my u with a times exponential bt. So for the BT, for I just plug in B times capital T. I just take again the time horizon. So the A is the important part here. And my A is C times H, giving me the strong convergence order estimate. Yeah? So H is the guy I would like to have yeah, because we have moved to the squared. Yeah? Going back to the square root, it is h to the power of one half. So I have strong convergence order one half. So that was the strong convergence. For the weak convergence, I need Feynman Katz theorem and Ito's lemma. Um, the weak convergence I mentioned is more relevant to us. And also the proof is quite, quite nice. Yeah? So not so much estimates. Um, also a quick proof yeah, with some intuition and let's do that in the next session. So that was it for the strong convergence.